Uh, thank you, Dr. Kangas. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be back with the Caspian Policy Center uh, today, even if it's virtually. Uh, I'd like to thank not only Dr. Kangas for the introductions, but uh, fellow panelists, Ambassador Hoagland, with whom I served in Tashkent uh, at the beginning of my Foreign Service career in the early 1990s, Ambassador Sakuda, Dr. Todd uh, Efgan, and the other Caspian Policy Center colleagues who arranged this event. Uh, I think, as Dr. Kanga said, we're now six weeks into the Biden administration. And even as the ranks of policymakers nominated and confirmed continues to fill out and will in the coming weeks, we are conducting policy reviews and developing new approaches to existing challenges. I do think it's important to underscore that the United States' strategic interests in supporting democratic, prosperous, peaceful, and secure countries in the South Caucasus and greater Caspian region remains steadfast. So to frame today's session, I'd like to share my perspectives on some of the security, governance, and development challenges and opportunities in the region. Please keep in mind, as I've noted in the past CPC sessions that were conducted at the Harvard Club on the margins of the UN General Assembly in New York, uh, that the State Department's regional bureaus divide the Caspian Basin between Central and South Asia, where I started my career, and the Caucasus in Europe, uh, my current area of responsibility. So starting with regional security, given the dramatic developments in 2020 in particular, uh, when I first began meeting with the foreign ministers and other officials from the South Caucasus in 2018, they would usually start framing their country's century long challenges uh, for statehood, prosperous statehood as existing within a triangle of traditional empires in modern successor states, Russian, Persian Iranian, Ottoman Turkish. And obviously for the Central Asian states, China would be added to that mix. And I, I do think it's always important to include Turkey uh, when we talk about the external uh, countries with both traditional interests and current aspirations. In 2020, what has been called by academics as the Second Karabakh War acted as a geostrategic earthquake for the regions. There was 44 days of intense fighting and a subsequent Russian imposed ceasefire arrangement. Azerbaijan, with Turkish support, reestablished control over parts of Nagorno-Karabakh and its seven formerly occupied territories for the first time since 1994. The Russian brokered November 9th, 10th ceasefire arrangement left many key issues underscoring the conflict unresolved, particularly the final status of Nagorno-Karabakh. Secretary of State Blinken has committed to reinvigorating U.S. engagement on Nagorno-Karabakh and bolstering support for the OSCE Minsk process with the United States chairs along with France and Russia, which has been always designed to facilitate Armenian Azerbaijan charting a path forward. In addition to a strengthened and more confident Azerbaijan, another result of the conflict and ceasefire arrangement is that the external powers uh, that we discussed earlier are newly assertive in the region or mentioned earlier. So I'll, let me go through each of them in, in turn. Uh, Russia uh, has successfully introduced 2,000 so-called peacekeepers in the territory of Nagorno-Karabakh. And that means there are now Russian military boots on the ground in all three South Caucasus countries for the first time since the breakup of the Soviet Union in 1991. After the battlefield losses by ethnic Armenian forces, Armenians feel even more reliant on Russia as a guarantor of their security. Meanwhile, Russia still refuses to withdraw its troops from Georgia despite obligations it undertook as part of the 2008 ceasefire. Turkey too has returned to the region with a military presence for the first time in over a century since 1920. On the trade front, on the flip side, there may be now opportunities to realize the delayed promise of the 2009 agreement between Turkey and Armenia that was held up because of the ongoing uh, unresolved status of the seven territories that have now returned to Azerbaijani control. Iran is also posturing to play a larger role in the South Caucasus following the 2020 fighting in the region that also went along its border. Tehran has stepped up diplomatic engagement with all three South Caucasus countries with the foreign minister re uh, recently making a swing through the region, but it was largely on the sidelines and the recent fighting. Without a formal role in the ceasefire arrangement, Iran may in some respects be finding itself looking on the outside looking in. Meanwhile, in Central Asia, China's One Belt, One Road initiative promises infrastructure, but often brings debt and limited benefits to the local population. 
In our view, the goal of state, China's state-owned enterprises and banks appears to be creating political leverage for the Chinese government to extract the benefits of that investment for China. In our view, Central Asia can also be linked to the world, not just through China, but through international private sector investment, if the governments in the region institute and commit to reforms to improve the business climate. In that regard, uh, good governance and judicial independence are critical. For its part, the United States is committed to working with the countries of the Greater Caspian region to create the conditions needed to unlock greater private investment, combat corruption, and secure nations autonomy from foreign malign influence. We will continue to promote transparency, openness, the rule of law, and respect for fundamental freedoms and human rights. It's worth emphasizing that a justice system with integrity benefits both a country's citizens and foreign investors who can create jobs, driving prosperity and growth at home so the citizens don't look for opportunity abroad. Some countries in the region have made positive steps forward that are worth uh, recognizing. The presidents of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan have initiated reform programs to strengthen governance and expand space for civil society. In Armenia, the United States responded to the uh, 2018 Velvet Revolution uh, and Prime Minister Pashinyan's government has admirably remained committed to a reform agenda that would benefit Armenia's society and economy, despite the upheaval following the recent ceasefire. Of course, challenges remain. In Azerbaijan and Central Asia, the United States will continue to profess, uh, press for enhanced respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms and the rule of law, including the release of individuals widely considered to be uh, political prisoners and detainees. Meanwhile, the recent political developments in Georgia illustrate the need for Georgia to reinforce its commitment to democratic principles, to strengthen judicial independence, and level the electoral playing field if Georgia is to realize its European and Euro-Atlantic aspirations, which we support. As the United States offers support to countries in the region on democratic development, we also see great potential for regional economic cooperation among the Caspian Basin countries and their neighbors. Overshadowed by the ongoing pandemic and outbreak of the fall conflict in Karabakh, the Southern Gas Corridor, a generational project, was completed under budget and on time with the final Trans-Adriatic Pipeline segment to Italy completed last December. The United States and the European Union's sustained support for this multinational public-private partnership was part of our long-term goal and commitment to improve European energy security, diversify gas supplies to Europe, and support uh, better regional cooperation. In January, Azerbaijan signed a memorandum of understanding with Turkmenistan on joint exploration of hydrocarbons in the Caspian. This breakthrough, after years of impasse, has the real potential to lead to greater connectivity between the existing energy infrastructure spanning the South Caucasus and the significant hydrocarbon resources of the Greater Caspian Basin. And I expect Ambassadors Hogan and Itsukuda will talk more about that. This initiative could be a real game changer. It represents a rational economic self-interest decision overcoming long-standing hurdles to an interdependent regional network. Talk of cross-Caspian trade, previously held hostage to the disagreement between literal states, have begun in earnest. Uh, one additional uh, sign of this is the recently announced plans to expand Kazakhstan's port Aktau to enable greater export of goods to Azerbaijan and onwards to Turkey and to Europe. Meanwhile, Afghanistan sees the Caspian region as a key potential export route for its goods via the so-called lapis lazuli corridor. This mo multimodal corridor has the potential to allow Afghanistan access to Turkish and European markets via Turkmenistan, Azerbaijan and Georgia. Enhancing regional connectivity and promoting economic opportunity for all are among the essential ingredients in this vision. And the same would apply for the Caspian, across the Caspian and the South Caucasus. The United States shares the Caspian region's goal of developing modern infrastructure, diversifying sources of energy and markets for energy and building competitive market environments. The United States is committed to promoting connectivity that advances national sovereignty, regional integration, and trust. And American companies are ideally suited to help build the modern, secure, and reliable infrastructure 
implementing advanced information and communication technology systems in the region. In conclusion, I'm optimistic that increasing connectivity and economic integration of the Caspian and South Caucasus countries with the support of the United States and partners has the potential to bring lasting stability and prosperity to the region. And with that, uh, let me turn the mic over to the other speakers uh, for what I am certain will be a lively discussion. Thanks.